Yeah. I think this is the earliest that I've recorded a podcast with someone. Is it? Yeah. So I don't feel like I'm. How are you feeling? Because I'm a morning person. Oh, you're asking me questions already. Yeah. Sorry. I <laughs> flick into <laughs> you, that mood. This is. This is. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's fun to interview someone that's job is literally chatting to people and interviewing. And this is terrifying for me. Really? Why? Because I hate talking about myself. I like asking questions about <laughs> other people. Is that why you're a TV, TV Yes, presenter? I think so. Because it's then, it's, uh, it's then not about you, is it? It's about it's the person point. you're interviewing. Well, we're at the Equine Show. We are. And you're, you're hosting this weekend. How is it? We're halfway through. Yep. How's it going so far? I feel like I've stepped into a dream world because Equine is what I've grown up in, mm. horses. So not only do I have all the best shops in the world yes. in one place, yeah. which I need to... my card is ready to go spending <laughs> today and you're not on stage yet <laughs> well I've got half an hour break I'm going shopping um but also I get to interview my heroes so we've got Piggy March today who I grew up watching when I was tiny although I won't tell her that because I'll make her feel old and <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know Carl Hester yesterday and and Silly Pearson to me those are those are people that I if I was in the audience, I'd be like, oh, I'm desperate to meet them. I want to speak to them. I want to ask my questions. The fact that I've been told you're on stage and they have to for half an hour sit there and answer your questions. <laughs> I like they, the way you said they that. Are they trapped. have to. They have no <laughs> choice. It's, it's that thing, isn't it? I think I always said I don't. I love being a fan, but I think when you're a, when you're a massive fan, they're always so good with you, but then they move on. You, they don't become a friend. Whereas when you interview them and you spend time with them, then you get more of a relationship with them. Yeah. And that to me is what I want That's to really do cool. without also being irritating, <laughs> <laughs> which I think I can probably be. Well, <laughs> thank you for having a conversation with us. We're, you're the first person on that's been in the equine industry. So there will be people listening that will you know, be coming in because you're a horse related person. Uh, but there will also be people listening that go, I have no idea about that yeah. world at all. So I kind of want to touch on that. But before we jump into it, there's something that we do on every podcast. I didn't actually prep you this beforehand. Classic. And so I'm sorry about <laughs> no, no, that. But go I'm going to put you on the spot yeah. for the end of the podcast. So you've got a bit of a time okay, okay. to think about it. But um, we ask everyone for a piece of advice. Okay. And they'll put that advice gets passed on to the next podcast guest. Love it. And they don't know who they're leaving it for. Um, but your piece of advice comes from a, uh, a running coach. Okay. Uh, it does it has like his own running app and does a lot of personal coaching and training people for marathons and longer distances and shorter distances. And his advice for you is: the longer we work at it, the better we get. Love that. So the question that kind of leads off of that is yeah. that you're now presenting, and I want to touch on that a bit more. But where did you kind of? start to realize that oh I might be quite good at this or I really enjoy this and then how have you started to or how have you developed over the time that you've been doing it to kind of get better at it and learn first of all that's an, a, a brilliant piece of advice because I think so many people start something they might do I think my first presenting job I, I probably mucked up a lot <laughs> and I instantly could have gone home and gone oh that's not for me but it is that thing of the longer you work at things the better that you get and and it's really hard to stick it out because you might get criticism and but someone said to me once if, if you're the last on the bus then you're going to be taken to your destination so you can always you know there'll be 10 presenters on that bus that want to get into it and then when it gets harder they instantly start getting off the bus because they're like actually I, not for me I can't sustain this but if you're the last one on the bus you're going to be chosen because you're the only one there so that's my thing of just keep going keep going but it all started for me I mean, I think when I was about four, I wanted to be a presenter. So I watched Claire Balding at Burley and, and Crufts and the Olympics and the everything that presenter. she does, the ultimate yeah. presenter, uh, who I've aspired to be like since I was about four. And I actually got to work alongside her at Burley last year. And honestly, I pinched myself and I, was, I played it really cool. I played it really cool to start with. And then at the end of the two days, she said, oh, how did you get all into this? And I said, well, if I'm totally honest, it's totally down to you because when I was four, I watched you. And I <laughs> just spewed. This is why I love you so much. <laughs> and bless her. She was like, that's great. <laughs> um, she is the ultimate presenter, but also the ultimate nice, kind, generous person. So that was a real privilege to, to be with her. But it's, um, yeah, it's going back to your question. It's been a couple of years now that I've been full-time doing it it all started from uh, the Magnolia Cup which I rode in it's a charity horse race so I was in the fashion industry before and from my profile from that I got asked to do this charity horse race and I just said to everyone I said I'm going to be a presenter one day uh, and I did another charity horse race and someone overheard me at lunch uh, at Ascot and they said well we need a new presenter for Royal Ascot will you do it 
And it was all, they said, for fashion. And I was like, oh, I don't like fashion. <laughs> so but I didn't say that. I thought, toe in the door, go for it. Yeah. Learn as much as I can about racing. Um, prove that I can speak a little bit about it. And then they went, oh, you like to do the racing. Do you want to be our racing presenter as well? I said, yeah. And it's just sort of gone from there, really. I've had amazing mentors like Ed Chamberlain, who's the main ITV racing presenter. Yeah. Nick Luck as well. I'm sure everyone in the horsey world will know his voice. If you've ever heard his voice, you just instantly know who Nick Luck is. Great voice. Great voice. Um, and so many, I mean, I could name 100 people who have, have helped me, which is a real privilege because I think a lot of people might think, oh, new presenter coming in don't want them to take my job <laughs> but actually what everyone does is go well you've got passion for it and you seem to be okay at it so let's help you uh and work with you and stuff like that so I think I've been really lucky in that sense and they were all in that situation at some point so yeah. you'd like to think that they'd go well I had a foot up by this person so I'm going to provide that to the person that's coming in next and if they exactly. see that you're genuinely interested and yeah. good at it and for me it was never about being in front of a camera or I don't want to be famous, I don't want that, which is an odd thing to say when I'm doing this job. But it, for me, it was the secrets of TV. I was obsessed with how things worked. Why do yeah. they wear an earpiece? What are they listening to? If we went to the theatre as a family, I wouldn't be watching the show. I'd be watching the stagehands in the wings. If you know, it just, I, I loved that. it. I watched on YouTube behind the scenes on how they make films. I didn't care about... When I was a model, it was... I mean, that world let's not even <laughs> it's just that's a different lifetime yeah. ago. but I was interested in how we made that picture you know the secrets of it there are some times where I was in Miami once and we were shooting against a white wall so we could have been anywhere and yet my view I did I did a book uh, for myself uh, that was my view versus your view and your view was me against a white wall but my view was an entire Miami beach with like naked men walking past and all this stuff so it's just it's so different, isn't it? So I love the secrets of, of TV and how it works. I completely agree with you because I come from film and TV studying and <laughs> I always find sometimes it's a little bit like when you know a magic trick yeah. and it's kind of like, oh, okay, well, I see how that's done now. It's quite cool, but I know how it's done. And my mum gets so annoyed with me when she goes, is that plane that's flying over the top real in that film or is that CGI? And I'm like, yeah, probably. Yeah, CGI. It's like, oh, I don't ruin it. <laughs> Although, if you've seen it. the new Top Gun, that is real. So, that's yeah, extraordinary. Well, Tom, Tom, Tom Hanks. Hanks. Like, yeah, uh, not Tom, Tom Hanks. Hanks. Well, you said it as well. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't we say, oh, God, this is awful? <laughs> I definitely said that I studied film and then and then completely forgot that. Let's, let's chat let's about Outside over. Native. Let's get, you know, let's this is not about films. That. No. But the podcast is called Outside <laughs> Native. And we, we generally are generally ask everyone that comes on what do they love about getting outside so I'm asking you that question everything I need outside I think I get really jittery if I haven't been out into the fresh air or been for a run there's something it's like freedom isn't it yeah. being outside I grew up in a family where it was very much you wake up in the morning you're shoved out the door don't come back in until <laughs> the bedtime um and we would just come up with amazing games and explore i just love being outside it, the endorphins that you get from it um we would just when we were little it was always just running around in the mud and you don't care and i think it gives you that don't care attitude and i still have that and i still need the outdoors and the animals that go with it and the wildlife and and everything but yeah i think if i didn't have outdoors i don't know if i would cope in life i need it at some point i mean even this morning just walking out to the car and i just was like yeah, because especially here where you're in an exhibition hall for two days hall, straight yeah. and you don't get, sometimes you don't get daylight in this time of, of the year when yeah. you're doing an exhibition. But And yeah. it's really important, isn't it? And mm. I, there's nothing beats it for me. I was in Dartmoor the other weekend and we went for a long walk, three hour walk, and it was raining cats and dogs. I mean, you've never seen rain like it. Neither of us had waterproofs on, but we never turned back and thought, let's go back to the car. We said, well, we're aiming to get to a waterfall to go for a swim. So we're going to keep going. And we got back to the car three hours later, absolutely head to toe drenched. We'd had the best time ever, laughed for three hours. And that to me is outdoors. I'm not a weather kind of girl. I don't need the sun and then everything. To me, actually just getting outside and totally back to nature and not caring whether it's muddy, wet, snowing, cold is the best fun. How important is being fit physically fit for being in 
to, for being a horse rider, whether it be uh, you know as a jockey racing or for jumping or dressage, like I think some people that might not be in that industry or might not be aware might think, well, how like how exhausting can it be actually riding a horse? I mean, answer that question. <laughs> I think it's a question that every horsey person go rolls their eyes and goes when people go oh you just sit there yeah oh yeah sure you wish. yeah <laughs> um going to jockeys I think jockeys is the best way to explain it when I first uh started riding as a charity jockey I also thought that I thought well they just sit there with short legs and short like <laughs> reins and they just sit there and can't be that hard they let the horse go as fast as they want it is the most exhausting thing I have ever done the way I can describe it is if you go into a really low squat on a wobble board and then have someone pulling you with your arms and you have to stay in that exact position without falling off then take the fact that you've got this enormous heavy horse strong who is actually pulling you up the gallops and you've got to hold your arms you know you can't move you've got to be there and you've got to control them it is every part of your body and also the balance because as a jockey they've got short stirrups so they are teetering on top of a mountain effectively Mm. and they've got to balance their core is unbelievable their arm strength their leg strength and yet for a jockey they also have to be a certain weight yeah so a lot of these jockeys will have water for breakfast and that's what they can do depending on what the weight they've got to be that day so you've got someone that's unbelievably fit and strong that's also not having the fuel that they need to do it it's extraordinary i did one race that lasted i think it lasted one minute and i'd done seven months training for it i could not walk for a week it was unbelievable but eventers dressage riders i don't think you can underestimate their core you're balancing on an animal Mm. and if you don't have that core you will just fall off and rhythm as well and rhythm exactly you've got to stick to the rhythm of the horse your legs have got to be clamped around them your arms but there's also a certain softness that you also need with a horse to to stick with that rhythm and you don't want to interfere with them i'm no expert i'm a fun rider i love my riding i've invented in the past i've you know ridden in charity races but i'm not a professional rider but fitness is the ultimate they you have to be fit you can't I know if I haven't ridden for a couple of weeks and I get on it's exhausting but the core strength that you need to sit on an animal and keep it in control is you can't explain it but the connection that you have with a horse is so strong I mean everyone knows how cats and dogs are the most common sort of pets and the connections that you get with that but a horse obviously they, they they're around for a lot longer they are massive animals. You ride them. I mean, that connection that you must have, especially when you're competing with a horse as well, is it must be so strong. And you know when the horse is not right and you know when it's it probably feeling quite good. Yeah. It, it, it seems to be such a strong connection that people can make with the horses they ride. Horsey people are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Your we, words. We Your are, words. I know, but everyone is because we do love, no matter what, people say that, don't they? They say horsey girls are crazy because you can get chucked off a horse and yet you'll go back to that and you'll probably say sorry to that horse because you love them so much. And it is that connection. It's the trust, mm. I think, more than anything. For me, anyway, I'm speaking from a personal point of view, is the trust that you have when you're on a horse, that they're not going to hurt you. They're not, they're not out to hurt you. know. But no. they're, they're not going to chuck you off and they are going to keep you safe, especially on a main road or something when you've got tractors coming past. The last thing you want is a horse that's going to spin and and all that sort of stuff but for me it's massively the trust that you have in a horse it's also the fact that they are so dependent on you it's like dogs and cats as well you have to feed them walk them but a horse is so dependent on you bringing them in you rugging them up correctly you looking after them and keeping them as much as a horse as you as you can and I think that's that's sort of what it goes down to I know I've got an ex-racer at home and I love him to bits he can be irritating. <laughs> I don't know if I can they swear have on this podcast, <laughs> but he can be something. Uh, when I bring him in sometimes, he can rear rough and he can spin round and he can be, you oh, know. They, know. Yeah, they have such personalities. They have they? such personalities, but I will get him into the stable and I'll go, oh, love you, sorry. <laughs> like, you nearly killed me. You nearly bear. killed me walking in. But for some reason, I'm like, oh, it wasn't your fault. It's okay. <laughs> so I think, yeah, it's that connection, isn't it? It's the it's the breath, it's the smell, it's the mucking out. It's You do everything for them. And it's a massive commitment as well. Yes. 
as yeah. well to have an awesome. But it, you've said it there as well. There's a danger element to it, which you have to, if you're if you're in the world, then you know. But it's a dangerous sport. Yeah, I was um, going up the gallops once on a on a racehorse, and everyone said to me, "If you get to the gallops, you'll be fine. He can he can spin and buck and rear before, but when you're on the gallops, he's a dream." And I thought, great. And I had my GoPro on and got onto the gallops. I thought, brilliant, we're good. And a horse four ahead of us. We're, we're going 28 miles an hour, so you're not going slow either. And a horse four ahead of us uh, got spooked by the sheep, spun round. Uh, she fell off. The next one did the same. The next one did the same. And I was like, oh, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> and mine just went from 25, 28 miles an hour to zero, spun, flicked me off. Um, I was absolutely fine. It is dangerous, but... We love it, mm. and I think the dan- the kind of love for it outweighs the yeah, of danger of it. And when you get that connection with the horse, it's sort of less dangerous. But racehorses are another whole level of scary. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> but I love them. Uh, that, do you have a discipline that you sort of are more involved with or prefer? Because, again, people that aren't aware of the equine industry might go... It's in the same way that you say, oh, cycling, you're a cyclist. Well, no, there's yeah, what road biking and there's exactly. mountain biking. Yeah, there's, velodrome. There's BMX, and, yeah. So show, flat, uh, dressage. You've got a number of different areas. Do you sort of spread yourself across or do you have a sort of so, preference? So I grew up in eventing, uh, never professionally, always for fun. And I love that. So that's dressage, show jumping and cross country all in one. And I absolutely loved it. I had brilliant ponies growing up. Very, very lucky to go about eventing on them. And then dressage, I'm hopeless at. I just am. I can see, you know, <laughs> speaking to Carl Hester and Salipis, and I can really see the satisfaction of getting a horse to do that and the control and the connect. It? It's, it's completely yeah. art. Um, I then got into racing, um, purely fell into it, and I fell in love with that side of things I'm definitely not a jockey I had fun doing a few charity races um and at the moment I'm I'm hacking I'm retraining an ex-racehorse uh I think my dream one day is to rescue any horses that need it and sort of bring them up and sell them on to people who who have loving homes but I love equine so any side of it I'm so fascinated in we had Ben Atkinson here yesterday who That's amazing. is a stunt rider and and trains these horses yeah. for films it's extraordinary. It's like teaching a dog how to sit, but it's a horse. You know, yeah. he can teach a horse to gallop at someone and lie down. So I think I'm fascinated in the connection of the horses. But yeah. You can see that as in when you're hosting, you said it at the beginning when we were talking. <laughs> of, I'm just like chatting to all of these people that are like so well known in this world and I get to talk to them and I get to enjoy yeah. sort of... Because as a presenter, you have to get that story across to them. Like people might know... People know Carl Hester, people yes. know Sir Lee, Pearson, Lee Pearson, but you are trying to, in that half an hour, get something from them that they might not have heard before yeah. or try and get a funny angle, you know, try and you're almost the, the medium of that presentation. So yeah. it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a it's a really weird job. I mean, when what was your first sort of TV, cameras in your face, You've got the microphone, you've got the earpiece in, someone's talking to you through your ear, which I can imagine is probably quite difficult at times. That was the most exciting moment of my life. I've dreamt of having an earpiece in <laughs> or since I was tiny. It sounds so lame, but it was so exciting. You weren't so nervous exciting. then, you were excited. It was so exciting. It was at Ascot. I was doing Royal Ascot a few weeks ahead, and they said, let's just do a trial day with you so you don't not jump straight into the deep end. And it's all the big screens at Ascot, so it's not ITV, it's not Sky, it's the big screens. But it's still TV, it's still cameras. And... I remember it so well because the first thing I did was eat on camera and I didn't realise that. So we would go, we go around all the restaurants and the bars in the morning and show everyone yeah, what's there. Uh, and it was a massive sausage roll. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realise that you're sort of meant to take an elegant tiny bite when you're on camera. And I just took a really big mouthful and my co-presenter, Stephen, <laughs> then purposely started asking me lots and lots <laughs> of questions. Trying going, to eat the rest of the sausage. Yeah. He said, yeah, first roll in TV. Uh, eat smaller mouthfuls, but it's now become a thing that I I don't know how to take a small mouthful. But it was really nerve-wracking, and suddenly a camera in your face, suddenly an earpiece. But I think my attitude to any job I've done is do it really well. So I sort of pretended I was a presenter. I know that sounds so weird, but you kind of pretend, I know what I'm doing, I'm just as good as Claire Balding, no chance. But you pretend you are, 
gives you that confidence it gives as well. you the confidence and then i go home and i go oh god i had probably that was really rubbish but you kind of embody being a presenter you know that what you're odd, talking right? about though hopefully <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i'm giving <laughs> you that knowledge research. yeah um yeah but that's the side of it i love i love the research i love learning about people if this weekend you know there are some people that i i haven't had to speak to before and it's awesome to get to research and learn about them and that for me is kind of the main thing is is the week before researching and getting to know someone and then getting to to chat mm. to them and like you said hopefully get something more out of them wanted to pick your brains about how you think the industry is becoming more accessible for anyone who wants to get involved in horse riding um, because I think it's no secret that people will think oh god I need to have you know there's a certain buy-in to, to own a horse and horses are expensive yes. um, and being in that world and especially it takes a lot of time as well if you want to be looking after the horse unless you want to put it in livery or whatever but how do you think it's developing to be able to access a new audience and sort of broaden the range of people that can be, you know, involved in this world. So we were talking about this with the lovely girls from birth yesterday. Um, and it was really interesting. They were saying, you know, there are new inner city riding schools. So I know there's one in Liverpool uh, with the Park Palace ponies. And there is one here in Birmingham as well to get people to ride horses there are also amazing therapy places like lunar eclipse who are also here up in scotland and they have therapy horses so it might not be that you want to be riding but just around them which i think is really great um there needs to be more done 100 percent. i don't i'm not across what everyone is doing but i know there are riding schools ebony horse club in london as well uh, khadija mella then won the magnolia cup that i rode against her uh and it's great to we were speaking to the girls yesterday and, and representation is huge mm. and we need more people representing a wider range of people. But I do think that's happening. I do think it's moving towards that way. The horsey world, the equine world is really accepting because everyone knows how hard you have to work. If you have a horse, it's not go on holiday for two weeks and leave the horse in a field. You can't do that. It's up early mornings. It's, you know, Harrison was saying yesterday, Harrison Ashton, he might be away for work, but then he's up at six o'clock in the morning to feed the horses, to muck them out, to check on them, to ride. So I think everyone in the horsey world has a respect for each other. Yeah. But if you are in it, you know how hard you have to work. But the other side of it, there are so many different ways you can get into it. You could be a groom for someone. You could, in racing, you could be a stable lad, which sounds real, <laughs> bit, <laughs> bit rubbish, but it's not. There's a guy called... Um, Damien at Charlie Hills, who had never been into horses before, he needed a job, so he started mucking out with, with Charlie uh, for the horses. And an amazing horse called Pogo came along, who he was then looking after. And if you look after one of the horses, you're leading them up at the, at the races. And he's travelled the world with this horse and got to ride at the Saudi Cup and uh, in Qatar and at the Breeders' Cup and all these amazing places. And, you know, he said but I knew nothing about horses and it's really got him into him. So if anyone wants to get into it, it's a, it's a great way to just go to a yard and say, I work really hard and I want to learn. Can I have a job? And if it's just starting mucking out or starting feeding, you don't have to be the best of the best. But if you're involved with horses, I think that's the main thing. But uh, that, yeah, there needs to be more initiatives. I and think. I, th I think once you get an eye into the, you know, sort of open that door, you realise how sort of wide... How much is involved with yeah. either owning a horse or just the horse world? Because I've lived on next to stables and my mum's had horses and our really close family friends own, own stables and compete. And it's, it's a whole world. Yeah. And you really see, again, I spoke about it before, the connection people have with horses as well. And if you, even if you just watch an event and you see um, a, a flat racing, whatever, and you see the owners and you see... Um, the grooms and you see the jockeys and it's such a it's a team effort and even though you can see, almost see it in the horse the horses love doing yeah. what they're doing as yeah. well I know that there's you know certain reputations that's that's out uh, about jump racing and whatever but you, the horses love they love it they love it yeah uh, and this and you can just see the passion from everyone involved in that in that horse in that race as well yeah and what I would say about you know, people that don't understand horses, whether it's eventing, dressage, racing, whatever the discipline it is. A horse is a lot bigger and stronger than us. If they don't want to do something, 
they don't do it. They they won't do it. You you can see that when they don't want to do it. And you see these amazing event riders, I'm speaking to Piggy March later, who go around these massive cross-country courses. I mean, they really are screw loose. <laughs> <laughs> I love them all. They, are, they have the most amazing attitude and confidence. They are unbelievable. They can only have that because of the partnership with their horse. Um, but I think it's just, it's extraordinary when, if you don't know the equine world, go, go to a yard, go and see how the horses are looked after, go and see how, how it works and you'll understand. And like you said earlier, you know if your horse isn't up to it today. And you'll see a lot of event riders, they might be going around the cross-country course and they'll retire halfway around because they go, actually, do you know what? The horse isn't feeling it and I don't want an accident and I don't want my horse hurt. So you, there is so much care and attention that and goes in into these horses well and in the ground. Yeah. And that's the thing, if you, you know... If you want to be a groundsman, that's still in horses. There's so much that goes into getting a horse to a race course or to the event. They are vet checked the whole time. If they're not right, they're not allowed to work. So I always say to people who who might not understand it, it's not it's not a bad thing. It's just lack of understanding. Yeah, awareness. That uh, go go and educate because we look after everyone. You have to, otherwise you yeah. wouldn't you wouldn't be successful. Thera- you said it there, therapy horses. That's something I didn't realise. No, that they did I really? And, and I was listening. Uh, it, they're part of rehab uh, centres as well. And because yeah. I remember watching an interview with someone who said, "Yeah, they stuck me in a in a field with a horse, and they said just talk to the horse, and I didn't get it. And then a few days later, I got it. it they're just such for such beautiful big. Some people find them scary creatures. Yeah, they are so calming and so. So beautiful. So why are they used as... And we've got the th- little therapy horses oh, here, which are the tiny. cutest things I'm ever. I'm going to take one home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to steal I one. I will be putting one in the boot of my car. But um, why do you think it is? I think, for me, it's the smell, it's the touch, it's their eyes, it's the their breath, it's their noses. I think they're so generous with you know, letting you stroke and groom. And for me, there's no better day than in the, on a hot summer's day, getting all the horses in and washing all of them and just TLC with the horses. There's just something about it. They were saying yesterday with the therapy horses, though, that they can slow their breathing down and their heart rate down to match ours. So that, or they can speed it up and they can really connect with you. If you put your hand on their chest, they learn how to breathe with you and connect with you and it's very much like a dog i think a dog knows when you're not feeling yeah, good yeah and they cut they they instinctively want to cuddle you and i think a horse also knows it people say oh, horses don't know who you are and guarantee when i got if i've been away for a bit and i got up to the field to get mine they in know. he knows who i am yeah. i well i like to think he knows who i am <laughs> that voice again yeah, yeah. Oh, starts gosh. running away <laughs> that's why he never lets me catch him um but yeah, yeah i think it is that i think it's their the smell, the breath, the everything. Quick final couple of questions because yes. I know you're opening the show yes. and I don't want to keep you away. There are probably people <laughs> running around thinking, where is she? I can't find her. Ah, Piggy can do but, it. <laughs> <laughs> but if you had to put yourself in an, uh, presenting an ideal event next to a person that you would love to present that with, anyone in the world, any race, any event, anywhere, what would you? who would you pick and where would you pick? The Olympics. Yep. Claire Balding. Easy. Done. Yeah, thank just you. be a perfect match. Yes. Well, maybe one day. Maybe one maybe day. One Although day. I'd look really bad against Claire Balding, so maybe let me choose someone else. <laughs> You'll be just staring there the whole time, going, "Yeah, Claire, you're so right. Claire, I, you're I agree just with so you." So good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I lo- I'd love. I love equine. I love my job. I want to do other sports as well. So yeah, Ooh, not give me give me two sports that you other want other sports you well, want to Olympic, do if you can. Olympics, yeah. athletics, um, tennis, Formula One. Uh, all these, I'm not an expert in any of these sports I enjoy watching them uh, I don't think you have to be an expert as a presenter as long as you know how to ask the experts the right questions so I would never be able to analyse you know, a Formula 1 race yeah. but I could ask the you expert can, and the emotions so of it wants and to give me a job <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Olympics, <laughs> Olympics Claire Balding bring it on, Paris it. 2024 <laughs> and the last thing, I opened it with a piece of advice from yes. Ben and now is your opportunity it, do, it can be about anything yeah. um, and it can't be the bus one because you've already used no, that that's fine. Uh, a piece of advice that we will pass along to a guest coming on in the future 
my piece of advice that I give to everyone, and it's my new mantra in life, is who cares? I had this when I'll try and yeah. say this quickly, but when I was a model, I was called fat every day for 10 years. And I, I know I wasn't fat, but it was, you know, it was that. I give the analogy, I don't know if it's the same for men, I'm not a man, but for women, I know, and we'll give it for a man as well, but if you're in a, a swimsuit on the beach with all of your friends and everyone has their phone, everyone has cameras, for me, I'd feel really self conscious and worried. I probably wouldn't run around and enjoy that beach day because I. It happened to me once that someone took a video of me running around, posted it on a WhatsApp group with 20 people I don't know. And I was just fine with my... It's taken me a long time to kind of be okay with what I look like because of the modelling industry. Yeah. Um, and I was feeling really good, but I hadn't looked in the mirror. I was just happy. And I saw this video and I went, oh no, is that what I look like? And my lovely boyfriend just went, yeah, and you look brilliant, you know, don't worry. And I just said, actually, yeah, just who cares? Like, who cares? Because if someone else cares what I look like, that is their problem, not mine. And I always think, if you went to that same beach, same bikini, same swimsuit, whatever, and no one had a phone, no one had a camera, would you care? Yeah. No, because it can't be documented. And I think so many people worry nowadays, especially young people with social media, that what they do is going to be captured, what they look like is going to be captured. I often put sweaty gym pictures up because I... Th- want to try and show young people you don't have to look good all the time I'm often in dresses and hats for Ascot and mm-hmm. races but that is one percent of my time <laughs> it's also joggers and a big jumper yeah, I was about to say yeah <laughs> it's jodhpurs and jumper and I never wear makeup unless I'm working so my mantra in life is who cares and if you're walking I'm t- I'm actually an introvert if you're walking into a restaurant and people are already there and you're late oh her- horrendous for me I think yep. people are gonna look at me I as agree. I walk in And I did this the other day and I sat in the car and I just went, who cares? Just who cares? Come on. And it's it's really changed my mindset in life of if I'm ever nervous, if I'm ever worried about what someone might think, I just go, who cares? Amazing. Well, I look forward to passing that along. Let's go and deliver you to the front of the show. Rosie, thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you very much.